Chapter 37 of Pushing to the Front by Horizon Sweat Martin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Luke Sartor. Chapter 37 Dare. The Spartans did not inquire how many the enemy are, but where they are. Aegis II. What's brave, what's noble? Let's do it after the high Roman fashion, and make death proud to take us. Shakespeare Let me die facing the enemy. Bayard Who conquers me shall find a stubborn foe. Byron No great deed is done by falterers who ask for certainty. George Elliot. Fortune befriends the bold. Dryden. To stand with a smile upon your face against a stake from which you cannot get away, that no doubt is heroic. But the true glory is resignation to the inevitable. To stand unchained with perfect liberty to go away held only by the higher claims of duty, and let the fire creep up to the heart. This is heroism. F. W. Robinson Steady, men! Every man must die where he stands, said Colin Campbell to the 93rd Highlanders at Balaclava, as an overwhelming force of Russian cavalry came sweeping down. Ay, ay, Sir Colin, we'll do that, was the response from men, many of whom had to keep their word by thus obeying. Bring back the colours, shouted a captain at the Battle of the Alma, when an ensign maintained his ground in front, although the men were retreating. No, cried the ensign, bring up the men to the colours. To dare, and again to dare and without end to dare, was Danton's noble defiance to the enemies of France. The commons of France have resolved to deliberate, said Mirabeau to de Brézé, who brought an order from the king for them to disperse, June 23rd, 1789. We have heard the intentions that have been attributed to the king and you, sir, who cannot be recognized as his organ in the National Assembly, you who have neither place, voice, nor right to speak, you are not the person to bring to us a message of his. Go, say, to those who sent you that we are here by the power of the people, and that we will not be driven hence, save by the power of the bayonet. When the assembled Senate of Rome begged Regulus, not to return to Carthage, to fulfill an illegal promise, he calmly replied, Have you resolved to dishonor me? Torture and death are awaiting me, but what are these to the shame of an infamous act or the wounds of a guilty mind? Slave as I am to Carthage, I still have the spirit of a Roman. I have sworn to return. It is my duty. Let the gods take care of the rest. The courage which Cranmer had shown since the accession of Mary gave way the moment his final doom was announced. The moral cowardice which had displayed itself in his miserable compliance with the lust and despotism of Henry VIII displayed itself again in six successive recantations by which he hoped to purchase pardon. But pardon was impossible, and Cranmer's strangely mingled nature found a power in its very weakness when he was brought into the church of St. Mary at Oxford on the 21st of March to repeat his recantation on the way to the stake. Now, ended his address to the hushed congregation before him, now I come to the great thing that troubleth my conscience more than any other thing that ever I said or did in my life. And that is the setting abroad of writings 
contrary to the truth, which here I now renounce and refuse as things written by hand contrary to the truth, which I thought in my heart and written for fear of death to save my life if it might be, and for as much as my hand offended in writing contrary to my heart, my hand therefore shall be the first punished, for if I come to the fire it shall be the first burned. This was the hand that wrote it, he again exclaimed at the stake, therefore it shall suffer first punishment, and holding it steadily in the flame. He never stirred nor cried till life was gone. A woman's piercing shriek suddenly startled a party of surveyors at dinner in a forest of northern Virginia on a calm sunny day in 1750. The cries were repeated in quick succession and the men sprang through the undergrowth to learn their cause. Oh so, exclaimed the woman as she caught sight of a youth of eighteen, but a man in stature and bearing. You will surely do something for me. Make these friends release me. My boy, my poor boy is drowning, and they will not let me go. It would be madness. She would jump into the river, said one of the men who was holding her, and the rapids would dash her to pieces in a moment. Throwing off his coat, the youth sprang to the edge of the bank, scanned for a moment the rocks and whirling currents, and then, at sight of part of the boy's dress, plunged into the roaring rapids. Thank God he will save my child, cried the mother, and all rushed to the brink of the precipice. There he is! Oh, my boy! My darling boy! How could I leave you? But all eyes were bent upon the youth, struggling with strong heart and hope, amid the dizzy sweep of the whirling currents far below. Now it seemed as if he would be dashed against a projecting rock, over which the water flew in foam, and anon a whirlpool would drag him in, but from whose grasp escape would seem impossible. Twice the boy went out of sight, but he had reappeared the second time, although terribly near the most dangerous part of the river. The rush of waters here was tremendous, and no one had ever dared to approach it, even in a canoe lest he should be dashed to pieces. The youth redoubled his exertions. Three times he was about to grasp the child, when some stronger eddy would toss it from him. One final effort he makes. The child is held aloft by his strong right arm, but a cry of horror bursts from the lips of every spectator as boy and man shoot over the falls and vanish in the seething waters below. There they are, shouted the mother a moment later, in a delirium of joy. See, they are safe. Great God, I thank thee. And sure enough, they emerged unharmed from the boiling vortex, and in a few minutes reached a low place in the bank, and were drawn up by their friends. The boy senseless, but still alive, and the youth almost exhausted. God will give you a reward solemnly spoke the grateful woman. He will do great things for you in return for this day's work, and the blessings of thousands besides mine will attend you. The youth was George Washington. Your grace has not the organ of animal courage largely developed, said a phrenologist who was examining Wellington's head. You are right, replied the Iron Duke. And but for my sense of duty, I should have retreated in my first fight. That first fight on an Indian field was one of the most terrible on record. When General Jackson was a judge and was holding court in a small settlement, a border ruffian, a murderer and desperado, came into the courtroom with brutal violence and interrupted the court. The judge ordered him to be arrested. The officer did not dare to approach him. Call a posse, said the judge, and arrest him. But they also shrank in fear from the ruffian. 
Call me, then, said Jackson. This court is adjourned for five minutes. He left the bench, walked straight up to the man, and with his eagle eye actually cowed the ruffian, who dropped his weapons, afterwards saying, There was something in his eye I could not resist. One of the last official acts of President Carnot of France was the sending of a medal of the French Legion of Honor to a little American girl who lives in Indiana. While the train on the Panhandle Railroad, having on board several distinguished Frenchmen, was bound to Chicago and the World's Fair, Jenny Carey, who was then ten years old, discovered that a trestle was on fire and that if the train, which was nearby due, entered it, a dreadful wreck would take place. Therefore, she ran out upon the track to a place where she could be seen from some little distance. Then she took off her red flannel skirt, and, when the train came in view, waved it back and forth across the track. It was seen, and the train stopped. On board of it were seven hundred people, many of whom must have suffered death but for Jenny's courage and presence of mind. When they returned to France, the Frenchman brought the occurrence to the notice of President Carnot, and the result was the sending of the medal of this famous French society, the purpose of which is the honoring of bravery and merit, wherever they may be found. It was the heroic devotion of an Indian girl that saved the life of Captain John Smith when the powerful King Powhatan had decreed his death. Ill could the struggling colony spare him at that time. On May 10th, 1796, Napoleon carried the bridge at Lodi in the face of the Austrian batteries. Fourteen cannon, some accounts say thirty, were trained upon the French end of the structure. Behind them were 6,000 troops. Napoleon massed 4,000 grenadiers at the head of the bridge. With a battalion of 300 carbiniers in front, at the tap of the drum, the foremost assailants wheeled from the cover of the street wall under a terrible hail of grape and canister and attempted to pass the gateway to the bridge. The front ranks went down like stalls of grain before a reaper. The column staggered and reeled backward, and the valiant grenadiers were appalled by the task before them. Without a word or a look of reproach, Napoleon placed himself at their head, and his aides and generals rushed to his side. Fought again, this time over heaps of dead that choked the passage, and a quick run counted by seconds only, carried the column across two hundred yards of clear space, scarcely a shot from the Austrians taking effect beyond the point where the platoons wheeled for the first leap. So sudden and so miraculous was it all that the Austrian artillerists abandoned their guns instantly, and instead of rushing to the front and meeting the French onslaught, their supports fled in a panic. This Napoleon had counted on in making the bold attack. The contrast between Napoleon's slight figure and the massive grenadiers suggested the nickname, Little Corporal. When Stephen of Cologne fell into the hands of the base assailants, they asked him in derision, Where is now your fortress? Here was his bold reply placing his hand upon his heart. After the Mexican War, General McClellan was employed as a topographical engineer in surveying the Pacific coast. From his headquarters at Vancouver, he had gone on an exploring expedition with two companions, a soldier and a servant, when one evening he received word that the chiefs of the Columbia River tribes desired to confer with him. From the messenger's manner, he suspected that the Indian chiefs meant mischief, 
and so he warned his companions that they must be ready to leave camp at a moment's notice. Mounting his horse, he rode boldly into the Indian village. About thirty chiefs were holding council. McClellan was led into the circle and placed at the right hand of Saltees. He was familiar with the Chinook jargon and could understand every word spoken in the council. Saltees made known the grievance of the tribes. Two Indians had been captured by a party of white pioneers and hanged for theft. Retaliation for this outrage seemed imperative. The chiefs pondered long, but had little to say. McClellan had been on friendly terms with them, and was not responsible for the forest executions. But still, he was a white man, and the chiefs had vowed vengeance against the race. The council was prolonged for hours before sentence was passed, and then Saltese, in the name of the head men of the tribes, decreed that McClellan should immediately be put to death. McClellan said nothing. He had known that argument and pleas for justice or mercy would be of no avail. He sat motionless, apparently indifferent to his fate. By his listlessness, he had thrown his captors off their guard. When the sentence was passed, he acted like a flash. Flinging his left arm round the neck of Saltese, he whipped out his revolver and held it close to the chief's temple. Revoke that sentence, or I shall kill you this instant, he cried, with his fingers clicking the trigger. I revoke it, exclaimed Saltese, fairly livid from fear. I must have your word that I can leave this council in safety. You have the word of Saltese, was the quick response. McClellan knew how sacred was the pledge which he had received. The revolver was lowered. Saltes was released from the embrace of the strong arm. McClellan strode out of the tent with his revolver in his hand. Not a hand was raised against him. He mounted his horse and rode to his camp, where his two followers were ready to spring into the saddle and to escape from the villages. He owed his life to his quickness of perception, his courage, and to his accurate knowledge of Indian character. In 1856, Rufus Shawait spoke to an audience of nearly 5,000 in Lowell, Massachusetts, in favor of the candidacy of James Buchanan for the presidency. The floor of the great hall began to sink, settling more and more as he proceeded with his address until a sound of crackling timber below would have precipitated a stampede with fatal results, but for the coolness of B. F. Butler, who presided. Telling the people to remain quiet, he said that he would see if there were any cause for alarm. He found the supports of the floor in so bad a condition that the slightest applause would be likely to bury the audience in the ruins of the building. Returning rather leisurely to the platform, he whispered to Shoate as he passed, We shall all be in, in five minutes. Then he told the crowd that there was no immediate danger if they would slowly disperse. The post of danger, he added, was on the platform which was most weakly supported. Therefore, he and those with him would be the last to leave. No doubt, many lives were saved by his coolness. Many distinguished foreign and American statesmen were present at a fashionable dinner party where wine was freely poured. But Schuyler Colfax, then Vice President of the United States, declined to drink from a proffered cup. Colfax dares not drink, sneered a senator who had already taken too much. You are right, said the vice president. I dare not. When Grant was in Houston many years ago, he was given a rousing reception. 
naturally hospitable and naturally inclined to like a man of Grant's makeup, the Houstonites determined to go beyond any other southern city in the way of a banquet and other manifestations of their goodwill and hospitality. They made lavish preparations for the dinner, the committee taking great pains to have the finest wines that could be procured for the table that night. When the time came to serve the wine, the head waiter went first to Grant. Without a word, the general quietly turned down all the glasses at his plate. This movement was a great surprise to the Texans, but they were equal to the occasion. Without a single word being spoken, every man along the line of the long tables turned his glasses down, and there was not a drop of wine taken that night. Two French officers at Waterloo were advancing to charge a greatly superior force. One, observing that the other showed signs of fear, said, Sir, I believe you are frightened. Yes, I am, was the reply. And if you were half as much frightened, you would run away. That's a brave man, said Wellington, when he saw a soldier turn pale as he marched against a battery. He knows his danger and faces it. There are many cardinals and bishops at Worms, said a friend to Luther, and they will burn your body to ashes as they did that of John Huss. Luther replied, although they should make a fire that should reach from Worms to Wittenberg and that should flame up to heaven, in the Lord's name, I would pass through it and appear before them. He said to another, I would enter worms, though there were as many devils there as there are tiles upon the roofs of the houses. Another man said to him, Duke George will surely arrest you. He replied, It is my duty to go, and I will go though it rained Duke George's for nine days together. A Western paper recently invited the surviving Union and Confederate officers to give an account of the bravest act observed by each during the Civil War. Colonel Thomas Wentworth Higginson said that at a dinner at Beaufort, S.C., where wine flowed freely and ribald jests were bandied, Dr. Minor, a slight boyish fellow who did not drink, was told that he could not go until he had drunk a toast, told a story, or sung a song. He replied, I cannot sing, but I will give a toast, although I must drink it in water. It is our mother's. The men were so affected and ashamed that they took him by the hand and thanked for displaying such admirable moral courage. It takes courage for a young man to stand firmly erect while others are bowing and fawning for praise and power. It takes courage to wear threadbare clothes while your comrades dress in broad cloth. It takes courage to remain in honest poverty when others grow rich by fraud. It takes courage to say, no, squarely, when those around you say yes. It takes courage to do your duty in silence and obscurity, while others prosper and grow famous, although neglecting sacred obligations. It takes courage to unmask your true self, to show your blemishes to a condemning world, and to pass for what you really are. It takes courage and pluck to be outvoted, beaten, laughed at, scoffed, ridiculed, derided, misunderstood, misjudged, to stand alone with all the world against you. But they are slaves who dare not be in the right with two or three. An honest man is not the worse because a dog barks at him. We live ridiculously for fear of being thought ridiculous. 
Tis he is the coward who proves false to his vows, to his manhood his honor for a laugh or a sneer. The youth who starts out by being afraid to speak what he thinks will usually end by being afraid to think what he wishes. How we shrink from an act of our own. We live as others live. Custom or fashion or your doctor or minister dictates and they in turn dare not depart from their schools. Dress living, servants, carriages, everything must conform, or we are ostracized. Who dares conduct his household or business affairs in his own way, and snap his fingers at Dame Grundy? It takes courage for a public man not to bend the knee to popular prejudice. It takes courage to refuse to follow custom when it is injurious to his health and morals. How much easier for a politician to prevaricate and dodge an issue than to stand squarely on his feet like a man. As the strongest man has a weakness somewhere, so the greatest hero is a coward somewhere. Peter was courageous enough to draw his sword to defend his master, but he could not stand the ridicule and the finger of scorn of the maidens in the high priest's hall, and he actually denied even the acquaintance of the master he had declared he would die for. Don't be like Uriah Heep, begging everybody's pardon for taking the liberty of being in the world. There is nothing attractive in timidity, nothing lovable in fear. Both are deformities and are repulsive. Manly courage is always dignified and graceful. Bruno, condemned to be burned alive in Rome, said to his judge, You are more afraid to pronounce my sentence than I am to receive it. Anne Askew, racked until her bones were dislocated, never flinched, but looked her tormentor calmly in the face and refused to adjure her faith. I should have thought fear would have kept you from going so far, said a relative who found the little boy Nelson wandering a long distance from home. Fear, said the future admiral. I don't know him. To think a thing is impossible is to make it so. Courage is victory. Timidity's defeat. That simple shepherd lad, David, fresh from his flocks, marching unattended and unarmed, save with his shepherd's staff and sling, to confront the colossal Goliath with his massive armor, is the sublimest audacity the world has ever seen. Dent. I wish you would get down and see what is the matter with that leg there, said Grant, when he and Colonel Dent were riding through the thickest of a fire that had become so concentrated and murderous that his troops had all been driven back. I guess looking after your horse's legs can wait, said Dent. It is simply murder for us to sit here. All right, said Grant. If you don't want to see to it, I will, he dismounted untwisted a piece of telegraph wire which had begun to cut the horse's leg, examined it deliberately, and climbed into his saddle. Dent, he said, when you've got a horse that you think a great deal of, you should never take any chances with him. If that wire had been left there for a little time longer, he would have gone dead lame and would perhaps have been ruined for life. Wellington said that at Waterloo, the hottest of the battle raged around a farmhouse, with an orchard surrounded by a thick hedge, which was so important a point in the British position that orders were given to hold it at any hazard or sacrifice. At last the powder and ball ran short, and the hedges took fire, 
surrounding the orchard with a wall of flame. A messenger had been sent for ammunition, and soon two loaded wagons came galloping toward the farmhouse. The driver of the first wagon, with the reckless daring of an English boy, spurred his struggling and terrified horses through the burning heap, but the flames rose fiercely round and caught the powder, which exploded in an instant, sending wagon, horses, and rider in fragments into the air. For an instant, the driver of the second wagon paused, appalled by his comrade's fate. The next, observing that the flames, beaten back for the moment by the explosion, afforded him one desperate chance, sent his horses at the smoldering breach, and, amid the deafening cheers of the garrison, landed his terrible cargo safely within. Behind him, the flames closed up and raged more fiercely than ever. At the Battle of Friedland, a cannonball came over the heads of the French soldiers, and a young soldier instinctively dodged. Napoleon looked at him and smilingly said, My friend, if that ball were destined for you, though you were to bury a hundred feet underground, it would be sure to find you there. When the mine in front of Petersburg was finished, the fuse was lighted, and the Union troops were drawn up ready to charge the enemy's works as soon as the explosion should make a breach. But seconds, minutes, and tens of minutes passed, without a sound from the mine, and the suspense became painful. Lieutenant Doherty and Sergeant Reese volunteered to examine the fuse. Through the long subterranean galleries, they hurried in silence, not knowing but that they were advancing to a horrible death. They found the defect, fired the train anew, and soon a terrible upheaval of earth gave the signal to march to victory. At the Battle of Copenhagen, as Nelson walked the deck slippery with blood and covered with the dead, he said, This is warm work, and this day may be the last to any of us in a moment. But, mark me, I would not be elsewhere for thousands. At the Battle of Trafalgar, when he was shot and was being carried below, he covered his face, that those fighting might not know their chief had fallen. In a skirmish at Salamanca, while the enemy's guns were pouring shot into his regiment, Sir William Napier's men became disobedient. He at once ordered a halt and flogged four of the ringleaders under fire. The men yielded at once and then marched three miles under a heavy cannonade as coolly as if it were a review. Execute your resolutions immediately. Thoughts are but dreams until their effects be tried. Does competition trouble you? Work away. What is your competitor but a man? Conquer your place in the world. For all things serve a brave soul. Combat difficulty manfully. Sustain misfortune bravely. Endure poverty nobly. Encounter disappointment courageously. The influence of the brave man is contagious and creates an epidemic of noble zeal in all about him. Every day sends to the grave obscure men who have only remained in obscurity because their timidity has prevented them from making a first effort, and who, if they could have been induced to begin, would in all probability have gone great lengths in the career of usefulness and fame. No great deed is done, says George Eliot, by falterers who ask for certainty. After the great inward struggle was over, and he had determined to remain loyal to his principles. Thomas More walked cheerfully to the block. His wife called him a fool for staying in a dark 
damp, filthy prison when he might have his liberty by merely renouncing his doctrines, as some of the bishops had done. But Thomas More preferred death to dishonor. His daughter showed the power of love to drive away fear. She remained true to her father when all others, even her mother, had forsaken him. After his head had been cut off and exhibited on a pole on London Bridge, the poor girl begged it of the authorities and requested that it be buried in the coffin with her. Her request was granted, for her death soon occurred. When Sir Walter Raleigh came to the scaffold, he was very faint and began his speech to the crowd by saying that during the last two days he had been visited by two old fits. If, therefore, you perceive any weakness in me, I beseech you ascribe it to my sickness rather than to myself. He took the axe and kissed the blade and said to the sheriff, Tea is a sharp medicine, but a sound cure for all diseases. Don't waste time dreaming of obstacles you may never encounter, or in crossing bridges you have not reached. To half will and to hang forever in the balance is to lose your grip on life. Abraham Lincoln's boyhood was one long struggle with poverty, with little education, and no influential friends. When at last he had begun the practice of law, it required no little courage to cast his fortune with the weaker side in politics, and thus imperil what small reputation he had gained. Only the most sublime moral courage could have sustained him as president to hold his ground against hostile criticism and a long train of disaster, to issue the Emancipation Proclamation, to support Grant and Stanton against the clamor of the politicians and the press. Lincoln never shrank from espousing an unpopular cause when he believed it to be right. At the time when it almost cost a young lawyer his bread and butter to defend the fugitive slave, and when other lawyers had refused, Lincoln would always plead the cause of the unfortunate whenever an opportunity presented. Go to Lincoln, people would say, when these hounded fugitives were seeking protection. He's not afraid of any cause if it's right. Then to side with truth is noble when we share her wretched crust. Ere her cause bring fame and profit, and tis prosperous to be just. Then it is the brave man chooses, while the coward stands aside, doubting in his abject spirit, till his Lord is crucified. Lowell As Salmon P. Chase left the courtroom after an impassioned flea, for the runaway slave girl Matilda. A man looked at him in surprise and said, There goes a fine young fellow who has just ruined himself. But in thus ruining himself, Chase had taken the first important step in a career in which he became governor of Ohio, United States Senator from Ohio, Secretary of the United States Treasury, and Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court. At the trial of William Penn for having spoken at a Quaker meeting, the recorder, not satisfied with the first verdict, said to the jury, We will have a verdict by the help of God, or you shall starve for it. You are Englishmen, said Penn. Mind your privileges, give not away your right. At last the jury, after two days and two nights without food, returned a verdict of not guilty. The recorder fined them 40 marks apiece 
for their independence. What cared Christ for the jeers of the crowd? The palsied hand moved, the blind saw, the leper was made whole, the dead spake, despite the ridicule and scoffs of the spectators. What cared Wendell Phillips for rotten eggs, derisive scorn, and hisses? In him, at last, the scornful world had met its match. Were Beecher and Goff to be silenced by the rude English mobs that came to extinguish them? No, they held their ground and compelled unwilling thousands to hear and to heed. Did Anna Dickinson leave the platform when the pistol bullets of the Molly Maguires flew about her head? She silenced those pistols by her courage and her arguments. What the world wants is a Knox, who dares to preach on with a musket leveled at his head, a garrison who is not afraid of a jail, or a mob, or a scaffold erected in front of his door. When General Butler was sent with 9,000 men to quell the New York riots, he arrived in advance of his troops and found the streets thronged with an angry mob which had already hanged several men to lampposts. Without waiting for his men, Butler went to the place where the crowd was most dense, overturned an ash barrel, stood upon it, and began. Delegates from five points, fiends from hell, you have murdered your superiors. And the blood-stained crowd quailed before the courageous words of a single man in a city which Mayor Fernando Wood could not restrain with the aid of police and militia. Our enemies are before us, exclaimed the Spartans at Thermopylae. And we are before them, was the cool reply of Leonidas. Deliver your arms, came the message from Xerxes. Come and take them, was the answer Leonidas sent back. A Persian soldier said, You will not be able to see the sun for flying javelins and arrows. Then we will fight in the shade, replied a Lacedaemonian. What wonder that a handful of such men checked the march of the greatest host that ever trod the earth. It is impossible, said a staff officer, when Napoleon gave directions for a daring plan. Impossible, thundered the great commander. Impossible is the adjective of fools. The courageous man is an example to the intrepid. His influence is magnetic. Men follow him, even to the death. Men who have dared have moved the world. Often before reaching the prime of life, it is astonishing what daring to begin and perseverance have enabled even youths to achieve. Alexander, who ascended the throne at twenty, had conquered the known world before dying at thirty-three. Julius Caesar captured eight hundred cities, conquered three hundred nations, defeated three million men, became a great orator and one of the greatest statesmen known, and still was a young man. Washington was appointed adjutant general at 19, was sent at 21 as an ambassador to treat with the French, and won his first battle as a colonel at 22. Lafayette was made general of the whole French army at 20. Charlemagne was master of France and Germany at 30. Galileo was but 18 when he saw the principle of the pendulum in the swing lamp in the cathedral at Pisa. Peel 
was in Parliament at 21. Gladstone was in Parliament before he was 22, and at 24 he was Lord of the Treasury. Elizabeth Barrett Browning was proficient in Greek and Latin at 12, De Quincey at 11. Robert Browning wrote at 11 poetry of no mean order. Cowley, who sleeps in Westminster Abbey, published a volume of poems at 15. Luther was but 29 when he nailed his famous thesis to the door of the bishop and defied the Pope. Nelson was a lieutenant in the British Navy before he was 20. He was but 47 when he received his death wound at Trafalgar. At 36, Cortez was the conqueror of Mexico. At 32, Clive had established the British power in India. Hannibal, the greatest of military commanders, was only 30 when, at Cannae, he dealt an almost annihilating blow at the Republic of Rome, and Napoleon was only 27 when, on the plains of Italy, he outgeneraled and defeated, one after another, the veteran marshals of Austria. Equal courage and resolution are often shown by men who have passed the allotted limit of life. Victor Hugo and Wellington were both in their prime after they had reached the age of threescore years and ten. Gladstone ruled England with a strong hand at eighty-four and was a marvel of literary and scholarly ability. Shakespeare says, He is not worthy of the honeycomb that shuns the hive because the bees have stings. The brave man is not he who feels no fear, for that were stupid and irrational, but he whose noble soul its fear subdues, and bravely dares the danger nature shrinks from. Many a bright youth has accomplished nothing of worth to himself or the world, simply because he did not dare to commence things. Begin, begin, begin. Whatever people may think of you, do that which you believe to be right. Be alike indifferent to censure or praise. Pythagoras I dare to do all that may become a man. Who dares do more is none. Shakespeare for man's great actions are performed in minor struggles. There are obstinate and unknown braves who defend themselves inch by inch in the shadows against the fatal invasion of want and turpitude. There are noble and mysterious triumphs which no eye sees, no renowned rewards, and no flourish of trumpets salutes. Life, misfortune, Isolation, abandonment, and poverty are battlefields which have their heroes. Victor Hugo Quit yourselves like men. 1 Samuel chapter 4 verse 9 End of chapter 37 Dare Recording by Luke Sartor, Brisbane, Queensland.